There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and to another episode of Zooming In, which is a new series on my channel where I invite, I loved coming up with this phrase, bookish social media luminaries <laughs> to have a little chat with me about a recent article online about a bookish or literary topic. And today I am deeply honored to welcome back to my channel, Trevor from the wonderful book podcast, The Moots and the Gripes. Trevor, welcome back. Thanks so much, Sean. I was so excited when you uh, sent me the direct message to ask if I'd join you and also very excited to talk about Stephen Milhauser. Did I spoil yes. that or am I okay? You did you? by about three seconds, so good for you. <laughs> We're here to talk about an article I stumbled upon in the Boston Globe, which is just a short interview with him, and it was published on August 10th, and I thought... Trevor loves Stephen Milhauser. I don't know a darn thing about him other than what I've absorbed here and there from the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. So here we are. Why don't you start by sharing your love for Stephen Milhauser, Trevor? Okay. Well, let me start with just a little bit of a story about a recent event. And you may know about it if you heard it on my podcast, but I have loved Stephen Milhauser's writing for a few decades now. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize in, I think, 97 for his book, Martin Dressler, um, which I, I did pull my books aside. I, I don't know if that works for you. That's great. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that one here in a few minutes, but that was the first book of his that I read. And the first time I read it, I was like, oh, that was pretty good. You know, well, I like that. And then I started to stumble on his short stories and it through venues like the New Yorker. I saw that he had a few collections out that looked looked strange i mean his his books this one's called in the penny arcade and sorry about all that shininess there but you know a little bit different from martin dressler's look at uh, new york city in the early 20th century here's a penny arcade um another collection that came out um at about that time was dangerous laughter and i thought i need to those just look interesting and i fell that's when i really fell in love with his writing and decided to reread Martin Dressler and just loved it. And ever since then, every collection that comes out, I am right on board with it. But it had been about a maybe 2015 was the last time he had a collection come out. And I hadn't seen any of his stories over the years in The New Yorker, though that was my own blindness. It looks like he has been publishing elsewhere. And periodically I'll look up just to see how he's doing because I knew he was getting close to his eighties. And so I was sitting at my computer on the Thursday night, a couple of weeks ago. And I thought time to look up Stephen Milhauser. How's he doing? Has he, has he, is he an octogenarian yet? Like many of my favorite short story writers get like Alice Munro. I remember when William Trevor turned 80, you know, those kinds of things. And so I looked him up and lo and behold, it was August 3rd that I did this and it was his birthday. It was August 3rd, 1943 is when he was born. And so I wished him a, a happy 80th birthday and at the same time thought, I'll probably never get a new book by him. And I just kind of scanned down the Wikipedia article where I saw, you know, that it was his birthday and there was a 2023 book called Disruptions. And I rushed to see what I had missed. And that Tuesday, so this is Thursday, so two days before, his most recent collection of short stories had been published. <laughs> it's called Disruptions. I go. like That's cool. cover. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> um, and it's published by Knopf. I thought, how on earth? I follow these guys, you know, more than is probably healthy. And yet I, this had completely missed me. I did not know this book was being published. And... I just felt very fortunate that I had looked him up and it was his birthday and there's a new book. It felt like my birthday. It was my own little Stephen Milhauserian uh, birthday present. So I actually only got disruptions in the mail yesterday. So I haven't read yeah. it, yet, but I can't wait. I'm very, very, very excited. But yeah, I, I love his his stories and I, I'm happy to start to tell a little bit why. But I don't know. Please, if you that was that or... was my next question. That was my next question. And it, it, am I right in gathering that you're actually more into his short stories than his novels? Um, that's a good question. 
he has two novels, Martin Dressler, which I do mm -hmm. think is a masterpiece. I, I do love Martin Dressler, but he also has this little novel called Edwin Mulhouse, subtitled The uh, Life and Death of an American Writer, 1943, that was the year Milhauser was born, to 1954 by Jeffrey Cartwright. This is my favorite book he's ever written, and it is his oh. novel. So mm -hmm. I would say it's one of my favorite books ever written. So I would say both. Is that cheating? Okay. I no, mean, no, no. <laughs> he is to me a short story writer who happens to have written two really great novels. Uh, one of which is one of my favorites, but he, you know, even um, Martin Dressler's the last novel he wrote, and that was in 97. So 26 years ago, yeah. Edwin Mulhouse came out in 1972. So over 50 years ago now, and those are the only two novels. So the rest of them are mostly short stories. He has a collection of novellas called uh, The King in the Tree. I'll okay. put it. Up. This is three novellas. This is my least favorite of what I've read is I, I think he works great, I guess, in short form or, you know, a little bit longer form. <laughs> the medium form, not so much. Um, do you get something different? Is he doing something different in the short fiction compared to the novels? Potentially, yes. So he, I think of him as a modern day romantic author, um, meaning, you know, thinking back on the, the literary term romantic, not like love stories or anything, um, though they can have that familiar longing, weird, a kind of absurd events that are exploring deep emotions and um, in strange ways. And some of his stories, then I would say, are like, you, you are the modern day Edgar Allan Poe in, in some ways. And he's a very, he loves, as he mentions in this um, Boston Globe article, he is a sentence writer. He he is delicate and he can write just beautiful sentences that I think come together, you know, coalesce into a great story. And his short stories, I think, show that off maybe a little more than the two novels because they they do get strange. He's got the, the Penny Arcade. He's got these, you know, kind of um, carnivalesque elements to them as well. And yet the thing that makes them kind of unique, at least to me, is that he he pulls them all together into American suburbia. <laughs> so a lot of his stories are like ghost stories that take place in small town Connecticut or things like that, you know, places like that. And his novels, I guess Edward Mulhouse is, is a little bit like a little bit of Americana. And certainly Martin Dressler, it won the Pulitzer because it's a New York novel you know it's it's a city novel and uh, and yet let me now say how i think they kind of relate if i can he has a mind that doesn't seem to stop and so in many of his short stories you think he's made you know several twists and turns or kind of working in miniature where he'll look over a landscape and then focus in on one thing and then he'll go deeper and then deeper and then deeper. It's like the movie Inception almost, where he just keeps going layer by layer by layer. And to me, he does that his best in Martin Dressler, where it's about this um, hotel. It's a boy who wants to start his own hotel someday. And so he builds this hotel that eventually he realizes if I can only put everything in it, no one will have to leave. And he takes that to just its extreme, extreme, extreme level and the emptiness that's created it's so it's such a good novel oh i'm loving this already and i and i'm just babbling on <laughs> well i'm loving it too because i did, don't know any didn't know anything about him what would you recommend what's the way into his oeuvre would you start with his debut novella or start with the stories or i think i would start with some of the stories because they're to me they're just delightful and if you like his bizarre sense of of telling a story I think you'll really um, find a way into the novels, but I wouldn't use like, if you're just a novel reader, go with the novels. I mean, but, but the one that I would recommend would probably be Edwin Mulhouse. I've already decided that's where I'm going to start. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just maybe entice you just a little bit. Please. This it, it's talking about an American writer and then it gives his dates of life, the life and death of this American writer named Edwin Mulhouse, who lived from 1943 
1954. So it's an 11 year old kid's life that we're reading about. And it's, it's also subtitled by Jeffrey Cartwright. That's his friend who seems to recognize the genius of Edwin Mulhouse and takes it upon himself to be his friend's biographer. Starting to ring a bell vaguely back in literary history. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and it's, it's so well written. I mean, there's just a flair to it. When I, when I talk about the romantics, I, I think that sense of a little bit of gloom and pessimism um, seeps into his writing a lot as well. And that's part of this. I mean, it's the it talks about childhood in a way that's very nostalgic, uh, both for its pleasures, but also for its horrors. Um, that are very real, not just a, not just a supernatural kind of thing. And so it's a it's a special book. Nancy Pearl recently was I don't remember what what we were talking about, but said this is one of her favorite novels as well. And I thought, oh, and it's so strange. This is a Pulitzer Prize winner, and I don't think many people have ever heard of him in any you know real way. Or if they have, he's kind of drifted out of their mind. It's like he has this power to be forgettable. And he said, when he won the Pulitzer Prize, people said it would change him. And I think he said something along the lines of, I dare it to try. <laughs> kind of this thing of, I'm not going to become one of these where I'm mostly on circuit, um, talking about the books I've written and the stories I've written. I'm going to keep doing what I do. And fame is not going to, to change me. And I think because of that, fame said, okay, we'll go deal with someone else then. You know, he's, he's not super well known. but. Definitely worth that's getting fascinating. to. That's fascinating. I want to jump off some of the questions that were asked of him in the article and ask them of you. But before I do that, how are you planning to tackle the new short story collection? When you read a short story collection, do you read it from cover to cover? Do you have it as a palate cleanser in between other books? How do you do? How do you approach it? Uh, depends on the on the the collection, but usually from cover to cover. I treat it as a book that I just want to keep on going and and like the recent uh, Tessa Hadley collection of short stories after the funeral, I thought, oh, this will be I'd read several of them. They were published in the New Yorker, and I thought, oh, this will be nice. I'll read this throughout the rest of the year, you know, periodically. No, I, I once I finished one, I would start the next one and <laughs> yeah, box of and chocolates. Exactly. I imagine that'll happen with the, uh, with this disruptions as well. I'll just, and I can't wait. I mean, the first one is called uh, one summer night and that, but, and that one looks interesting. I've read the first like line just to get a sense of it, but the next one is after the beheading. And I'm like, I can't wait to get to that, but I'm going to read one summer night first and then, you know, get to that one. He's got these, the little people, um, a haunted house story, the summer of ladders, which as I understand it is about people who build ladders that go up into the sky and they, as they climb them, they disappear. I mean, it's just, they're, they're fair. They're fabulous. They're fairy tales in a way, but I guess that's where I kind of more link them to like Edgar Allan Poe, that there's an element of, of, uh, of American horror in from in that vein in a lot of his stuff. At least that's how I feel. I don't know if others think of him that way, but. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the new collection, and you certainly piqued my interest in him as a writer. Um, what did you make of the thing that uh, first I first connected with in the interview is that he said that for uh, the last couple of months, he's been reading Anita Bruckner, Penelope Lively, and Barbara Pym. Uh -huh. What did you make of that? <laughs> uh, maybe he's been listening to our podcast. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I uh, certainly have. These yeah, these authors need need um, all the the extra life that they can have at Bruckner and Lively and Pym, and it certainly is not just us talking about them. We did a recent Barbara Pym episode, and that we we bring up Anita Bruckner all the time. I, I don't I don't really know Penelope Lively that much. She's one that's kind of on my shelf to to get to, but yeah, I liked that. I, I loved that they there there's a time period and a certain sensibility. And that he's in that because that's that's where I like to spend a lot of my time too is with these these women authors uh, writing about their small small towns and such too. Absolutely, and I love this sentence. He said, "I love the idea of this fixed small routine that can be thrown into disarray by some unexpected event." Mm -hmm. Lovely. 
And right above that, he says, just a man looking at a lonely woman can change her entire life. These, these women authors do that in such a, a heartbreaking way as they're examining the, you know, the lives of these, these female characters. And, and he's cottoned on to that, you know, that, that subtle little, little thing. I am rereading Barbara Pym's debut novel, Some Tame Gazelle. So that was a really, that line really spoke to me as well. The first question about him as a reader, I'm not going to ask you to describe yourself as a reader because we don't have all day and you have a whole podcast about that. But um, some of the other ones. Yeah, I'm very curious about this one, Trevor. Do you read more than one book at once? Oh, I have. I'm a chronic over, um, you know, my, my I, I read too many books at once. To the point where sometimes I'll look at my shelf and think, I forgot that I was reading that book. When did I last pick it up? It's been, you know, a, a few weeks or a month and I'll get back to it. Uh, but yeah, I can't, I can't resist when a new book shows up. I often want to start it. So Andy Miller in his book, The Year of Reading Dangerously, he, he says that finishing books is a skill that you can lose if you don't practice it. And there probably was a time where I would start so many books that I wasn't finishing them. And I am getting, I'm getting really good at, at still finishing them. I finished a book this morning. I'll finish another one later on today. I've been reading both of them for some time, but it's, you know, they're, they're, their time has come. I'm at the end of them and I have a few others going on. <laughs> but as nonsensical as it looks from the outside, my reading life where I'm reading dozens of books at the same time makes perfect sense to me. Yes, exactly. Whatever works for you to help you that's, keep getting that thrill of, of reading. <laughs> that's right. Are you a nonfiction reader? I think the answer is yes, to at least to a certain degree. Yeah. So this year and last year, I've been keeping track of my reading on Storygraph. Um, I like it as a, as a way of, you know, I log the books that I finished and it keeps track for me. And I think this year I'm about a third nonfiction. Oh, okay. which might, I'm feeling like that might be a little high higher than my average, but I do read biographies, um, especially of authors. I like author biographies quite often. I do like the occasional uh, more popular thriller history, you know, I, not necessarily true crime, but a lot of these publishers put out those really well-written um, stories about like Victorian criminals. And I, I do okay. love that. And, and so those count as nonfiction. I'm not really a big, hey, this new, you know, thousand page biography of, you know, so-and-so is out, uh, this political history. I, those are ones that I, I try to listen to sometimes if I feel like I should, and I, I tend to not finish those. Um, my, my nonfiction reading is more nature-based, thanks okay. to Paul, <laughs> and those other things like I was just uh, mentioning. The next question that Milhauser got asked is, do you read poetry? I do. I'd like to read more, uh, but I do read poetry. Um, I have uh, quite a few books of poetry on my shelves that I'm still getting to, but I, I do. I'm one, I love going to the poetry section in a bookstore and taking a gamble. Sometimes I have no idea what I'm reading, and I think that's okay. <laughs> I think it is too. And other times I just find is absolutely awe-inspiring in, in, in some book of poetry. And so I I'm not the best poetry reader, but it is something that I I do follow up to a degree and would love to do better at. Do so. you have a favorite poet or poem? Oh, that is a good question. Let's see. I mean, we did an episode on Emily Dickinson. That seems pretty pretty easy. So let me kind of spring off of that and say, I think he's he kind of ebbs and flows for, for me a little bit. I'm still not sure what he's writing as poetry sometimes it seems like just really fun little short essays but i really like billy collins um he was the american poet laureate the u.s poet laureate for a time uh, maybe 20 years ago or so and he wrote a poem called taking off emily dickinson's clothes which sounds a little saucy and maybe it is a little bit but it's a, just a beautiful poem and I find that he has a really good ability to just, his poems feel easy to me. And then I'll reread them and start getting more and more layers. But they're so accessible 
uh, like there are other poets that I have on the shelf here, um, like Merwin, W.S. Merwin. I think he is a, just an astounding poet. And I have to work to, to read his poems more than a Billy Collins poem. There's, there's something, something to the differences there. But I'll, I'll throw Billy Collins out there as, as someone that, I, that probably got me reading poetry. Oh, not so. the, the last question in the interview is what will you read next and i know that one of your answers but surely you have another book you can also tell us about that you're going to be reading next uh, yes so disruptions by stephen milhauser as you know and yes. then let me if you'll give me 10 seconds i'm pulling up oh my... you can have 45 seconds or more <laughs> I have a list of books that are coming out in September that I still need to read for review purposes, but also just because I these are the ones that I'm so excited about. So I have been reading Wednesday's Child, uh, the new collection of short stories by Yi Yun Lee, and that comes out on September 5th. Uh, okay. J.M. Cutsey has a new novel that's fairly short called The Pole that I'm trying to decide between that and Olga Raven's My Work. Both of those come out later on in September. Olga Raven, Raven's book is much thicker than Cutsey's, but after really loving her book, um, the employee. uh, the employees, I can't wait to get to my work. So she's she's an author that I just getting to know this year that has been a, a, a fun discovery for me personally. So it'll be one of those two, along with finishing out Wednesday's Child and um, Disruptions. I'm willing to wager that you're probably going to start both of them. You're not going to choose one or the other. You're going to start both of them, Trevor, aren't you? <laughs> you're probably right. And the list is big. September is a big month. There are others that I could uh, that I could throw on here. One that I have started that I, I kind of put aside because I got it quite in advance was Benjamin Labatut's new The Maniac that comes out in October. And Don't I'm, you think I should I, read that one? <laughs> yes, you should read John that. On the one. book mania, yes. he's probably writing about. He's writing about eccentric, you know, people who get get really uh, good at, at their 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 jobs, maybe to their detriment, you know. <laughs> so okay. it, 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 that one's a that one's one that I'm I'm really excited about too. But yeah, the list goes on, and you're right. I'll probably start more than these over the next few days, but those are among them. I believe I just accidentally enabled you. So, yep, go me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Trevor, this was a wonderful chat. I hope you'll come back again. I, I would love to, Sean. And I always feel welcome to uh, to ask because it, it is a delight and one that I myself wouldn't want to be like, hey, Sean, I'm ready to come back right now. But I'll, I'll try and keep the door open that way by telling you that I would love to, to come back. But I, I will always... Um, respond to your DMs in, with excitement. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trevor.